Hi, Brian White is filling in for Buck Lavasser. Tonight we'll spend some time on the water with a UP fisherman who has hopes of going pro. 23 years old. I've been fishing for 21 of them. My dad and my grandpas. Um, they're the ones that taught me how to fish. Decent large boat there. Then we'll find out why right now is the time to get our apple trees in the ground. All that and more tonight on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover when you're a long-time lover of northern Michigan. Many of us who fish have often thought, man, if I could just find a way to make a living at fishing, I'd have it made. Then we think about it from time to time and just dismiss it as a pipe dream. Getting some air to them. Wonder how many of us could have made that dream a reality if we'd stuck with it, followed our passion and saw it through. I met up with Zach Hill, a UP fisherman who I believe intends on doing just that. Well, it's uh, pretty much my passion in life. A lot of little small mouth in here, a lot of big ones. Just a matter of finding them. Some of the things I'm keying in on, it's all these down logs. This whole shoreline is just full of them. Nice drop off right here. Right now we're at 21 feet of water and we're maybe 50 feet offshore. Pretty sharp drop off. A lot of places to hide something over their heads. Little small mouth. Well, I got uh, Power Team lures, five inch finicky ticklers. Most of the time, they'll grab it right on the drop. Give a little twitch on its way down. Not a bad size to them, little guy. But... Got a four out Gamakatsu octopus hook and five inch power team lures finicky tickler. It's gonna take it, thread it on through the nose, just like so. Keep going, and as soon as it starts to taper down, right there, pop through and push it up for a nice little J in it, real slight. So that way, when you work it through the water. When I reel in, I'll give my rod a twitch, pick up the slack, a couple little twitches, let it drop. Finesse fishing, like with uh, plastic worms, it's always a good option. Um, bass go through moods just like we do. Sometimes they're happy feeding off the top, other times they just want to hang out on the bottom. And you really can't go wrong fishing this way, because if they're hanging out in the bottom, don't want nothing to do with regular lures, throw on a plastic drag it in front of their face and activate their lateral sense. It should strike it, at least get a reaction strike. And even when they're in a positive mood, you know, they'll follow it for 30 feet or more. And they'll still grab it, so you just can't go wrong. Got some weight to them, nice and fat. Look at, just made a meal out of something. A lot of people see me fishing upside down like this. It's really, I know it's wrong, but it's not really any different. Um, spinning rods a lot weaker when they're upside down. This would be better for a casting rod, but works for me. Better control. 
can actually you know, get it right over where I want it. Same as upside down. A little more sensitive. Oh, there we go. Decent large bolt there. There we go. Yeah. Nice and fat. And you pick up a fish by the mouth. This is uh, one of my pet peeves. You can't go more than a 20 degree angle holding it one handed. It'll snap its jaw, you'll kill it. It's not good for conservation efforts. So straight up and down or two hands. All the little ones in here, you know, bass fishing especially, panfish around. It's the reason I use big hooks. Uh, one knot or bigger. So, uh, most of the time they can't swallow it. See the way my rod's bending. Even a little smallmouth like this. Just the amount of fight they have. Bent my rod almost in half. As far as smallmouth go, uh, Power Team Lures Grubs here. These work really well on a it's a 3 op Mustad screw lock hook, EWG, with an adjustable weight up front here. You can move it you know, to the back, middle, I come to the front, so they cut through the water like that. Just kind of bounce off the bottom. This is a Power Team Lures 7 inch finicky tickler and ox blood. And this one actually has a bigger bulbousy tail at the end, so more of a snap whip to it. I'm catching a lot of largemouth on these. Main difference I've noticed is smallmouth will grab these on the drop, whereas a largemouth, you just dead stick it, let it sit. They'll grab them whenever they want. A lot bigger. I love smallmouth fishing. There's so much more fight in largemouth, pound for pound. Yeah, those little ones are just ferocious today. It's got some weight to them. how aggressive they are. Suck it right down. There's a good 16 maybe. A lot of different types of plastics out there. My favorite being uh, Power Team Lures. We got here four and a half inch grub and black and blue swirl. 
Got a curl tail on it. Real nice uh, ridges. Here's another Power Team lures. It's a, called a six stick. It's five inches. Got a nice stripe pattern. Got a half and half bass. Love that out here. Rig it up on uh, different jig heads and these ribs. Displace a lot of water. Great for wacky rigging. So I just drag it through the water. It goes like that. Really affects the fish's uh, senses. Lateral line. It's got 3.6 inch hammer shad. You can see it's jointed. Real nice action through the water. This is panicked perch color. Nice silver bottom, green top, hammer style tail. Of course you got your scents. All power team lures come with this, pre in the bag. Um, you can buy an extra bottle, make it extra stinky, full of garlic and uh, amino acids. Bass love it. Um, it is pretty stinky. I love smallmouth fishing. Uh, to me it's one of the best things you can spend your day doing. Fall is on its way, and with it comes the harvest time for gardens and trees. And that, of course, includes apples. I spoke with Lee Vinson of Lee's Greenery and Powers to get the scoop on planting apple trees, what to do, and when to do it. I don't think there's a real bad time uh, as long as you have a water source. You can plant a tree in the summer when it's dry as heck, but you definitely have to water it. And don't be afraid to water it because I don't think you can drown a tree, especially an apple tree. And the fall time of the year is actually really good. If you plant them in October, they're definitely not going to grow anymore, but you have them in the ground for the springtime. Spring, it's always wet. You don't really have to water them till probably July. A lot of people, they think because they give it a couple of gallons of water when it's a dry period and they think it's okay. Well, it doesn't get down to the root system where um, that's where you want it to be. Um, you give it a couple of gallons of water, it's going to soak in an inch, maybe two. So if you give it 10 gallons of water, it'll soak all the way to the bottom and get where the root is, and you'll have a better root structure that'll uh, just take off for you. The trees I usually try to get is your bigger varieties, so your one inch diameter. They're usually three years old when I get them. Water is the main factor the first three years. So after three years, you should uh, have apples on them. As long as you give them enough water, you know, throw a little fertilizer around them. You don't need a lot, but uh, I usually use triple 19. Uh, makes them nice and healthy. And after the third year of growing an apple tree, um, they really take off. They, you know, the root structure is out there. I always tell people when they're planting a tree, the bigger the hole with soft dirt in it, your roots will spread out so much faster. So a two foot hole is great. Um, if your ground isn't too hard to dig in, you know, make a three foot hole and then put some good soil in it. And it's amazing how fast they'll grow in that short of time because they, you know, they don't have to fight to get through that clay. After that, it, you know, they'll grow through rock once they get going, but uh, it will take a long time. Um, you know, back when I first started planting trees, that's what I did. I dug a hole about a foot wide and, you know, a foot deep and threw them in there and uh, the trees just sat there for about four years before they even grew a couple inches. It's, uh, it's amazing, you know, how much better it would be, you know, like I say, with the bigger hole, soft dirt. I try to go with the zone four apples, so, you know, they're hardy for our area. And as far as what you look for in buying an apple tree, yeah, you don't want to get one that's been dry all summer sitting in the parking lot of a regular store. Go somewhere where they're taken care of, they're watered, they're sprayed for bugs. They look healthy green. Look for the limb structure too. You know, a lot of times you have to cut the bottom limbs off anyway. They're going to be too low, especially if you're cutting grass around them when you're at a later date. Around here, you got to get them up about eight feet and then let the limb structure spread out up there. That way they're, the deer are still going to get the bottom ones if they have apples on. But other than that, uh, you'll get them out of reach faster. Um, if you look right here, here is your graft, okay, here's a wound here. This is just a regular wild apple root, and then they take this kind of a tree, wool dart apple, and they'll graft it onto here. Instead of growing an apple from seed, it speeds up the process. I always try to leave that above ground about an inch, maybe a little more. You know, um, there is a chance that if you you know, stuck it below the ground, it, you know, it could rot there. Um, 
if it's not healed perfectly. But if you keep it above ground, which will stay dry. See how wide the roots are on this one. What you try to do is make the hole so you don't have to bunch them right in there. And it's pretty much the right height. What we'll do is we'll dump a lot of soft dirt around it, okay? That's just regular potting soil I use there. Okay, now I have some compost. I'd say it's real great, great dirt, uh, organic. What you do when you plant a tree, uh, you know, if you spend $33 on a tree, you might spend another $10 on good soil to put around it. And you kind of put it around here. Then to make sure, make sure there's no air pockets, I kind of just dump a little water. On this one, we need a little more. Just all-purpose potting soil. Try to get all the, uh, so there's no air pockets around it. Uh, an apple tree is very tough. Um, I don't think it would bother it, but if you plant uh, maple, stuff like that, do a little touch here. And then I'll go back here and uh, actually the topsoil was pretty good when I dug the hole. And you kind of pack her in. Well, I dug the holes yesterday and uh, what I did was I filled up the holes with water right to the top. So now I know that it's a lot of moisture in the bottom of that hole, which the ground was already moist, but I made it a little extra moist. Look pretty straight, Haley. As you see here, uh, there's like a little trough. Uh, when you water, it'll suck it down. A lot of times if you, if you fill it right to the top, you water it, all the water runs on the grass. So if you leave a little trough, it helps quite a bit. So the next thing I do, I'll mulch it. I'll let Healy spread her out. I got one more here. This will help hold the moisture. This time of the year is a good time. We usually don't get much rain in August, but we did this year. But come September, uh, October, you shouldn't have to water much. But just remember next spring, um, if it's dry, you definitely have to water. At least the first couple of years. Looks good. I cut these limbs off. Because they're definitely too low anyway. Try to cut it as close as you can to the main. If you leave them on, uh, the deer are going to eat them up anyway. So you might as well get a higher structure up here. So they get out of reach faster. Another thing you could do if you got a limb, if you're worried about, I mean, you can you can put some of the tree wound dressing on here. Um, I usually don't. I mean, like I said, an apple tree is pretty tough. You know, usually if you cut a big limb that's a couple inches around, then I usually do, so the bugs and that don't get in there. Fruit tree spray, uh, the dormant spray you spray on before the leaves, or you know, when the tree's still dormant, and. Uh, what I use, I just use a regular fruit tree spray. Well, you know, which you spray before blossom and after blossom and a couple other times during the year uh, for that apple maggot and your aphids and all that kind of stuff. But usually the uh, second or third week of July you spray and then usually it's one week into the August area. Usually takes care of them. It's all purpose. It has uh, a fungicide plus an insecticide. Um, makes it kind of easy. It's all in one. As far as this wire right here, I know it's not big enough, but I do have to buy some more. So, but most of the time it'll it'll stand there because the deer will be able to reach over here, this one, but it won't kill your tree. But uh, that's the idea. You have to make it. I usually cut about 25 feet. Then it's usually big enough to stay out of reach of the deer for a while. The wire works until you get apples on the tree, and then the deer just kind of push it in. Um, but the tree's big enough, they're not going to kill it. 
When you have a smaller tree, the white wraps work on it pretty good. All my trees, I am going to put all this mesh on there. What's nice about it, you make it big enough so you don't even have to take it off. You just leave it on because it's getting the air where the white wraps that you have on the trees, you should take them off in the summer uh, so the bark isn't getting wet behind that. There's another kind of like a brown paper wrap that you wrap around your tree, um, which you, it'll work if the snow's real high, you can go real high, but uh, you definitely have to take that one off in the summer because you won't get no air behind that. This tree here has a little touch of the fire blight. Still seems healthy enough, so should be good. But you can, uh, you can save them by cutting off them dead limbs as long as they don't get into the main stock or your bigger limbs. And like I say, if you get it too bad in your tree, you're best off to cut it down and get it out of the area so it don't spread to the other ones. People lately, uh, the last few years, about three years, they've been asking for peach trees. Now they have one that's called contender peach. People, for the last three, four years that planted them, are getting peaches on them. This is a contender peach right here. It says it's zone four. It's winter hardy to 30 below. If you can get them started for the first few years, um, I always say protect them on the, uh, maybe a south side of a building. Uh, get them out of that north wind. With our winters being a little milder now, you know, you don't get that 30 below. Um, there's also, Pear trees, a lot of people like the pear trees. Uh, most of them are for our area. You always need a couple for pollination. Uh, they produce a lot of pears once they get going. And if you got deer or you're at a camp, you, you can't pick the ones on top anyway. So when they fall, you have a pretty good food source for the deer to come in. The other trees we handle is like a plum trees. There's many different kinds. There's a Mount Royal plum, which is a, a blue plum. Uh, it's self-pollinating, so you don't need more than one. And there's superior, uh, the toka plum, usually you need with that variety to uh, pollinate. If you don't have a pollinator with them, um, you won't get any plums. Well, that's it for this week. If you're planning on planting apple trees, I hope tonight's show provided some help. And Zach, good luck on your fishing endeavors. I hope we see you someday in the winter circle. Thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering.